This is episode 53 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Beato. I'm very excited to share today's conversation with you. I had the privilege of speaking with April Snow about highly sensitive persons, or HSPs. April discusses what it means to be highly sensitive, the challenges that highly sensitive persons experience, misconceptions about being highly sensitive, and some ways that those who are highly sensitive can begin to create a life that is more aligned with who they are. April Snow is a marriage and family therapy intern in supervised private practice in downtown San Francisco, helping her highly sensitive clients discover more about their sensitivity, manage the overwhelm and emotional intensity that goes with it, and have more fulfilling relationships. Her belief is that being a highly sensitive person doesn't have to stop you from living a fully engaged life. It's just a matter of knowing yourself and making adjustments to care for your unique temperament. Through April's blog writing, social media presence, and work with clients, she is on a mission to destigmatize the word sensitive and highlight the sensitive strengths of being able to live, love, and feel deeply. April is also passionate about supporting other highly sensitive therapists to help them clear the storm of overwhelm in order to access their therapeutic gifts and more fully support their clients. You can find out more about April's work at www.expansiveheart.com and www.sensitivetherapist.com. Hi, April, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for being here. I am really looking forward to having this conversation with you about highly sensitive persons, or as you know, the, the for short HSPs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I because I feel like this is really a group of individuals that are misunderstood. There's not a lot of information, mm-hmm. and there are a lot of assumptions. And as a mm-hmm. highly sensitive person myself, I know that once I began to understand certain qualities mm-hmm. about myself and learn how to to work with them, it really it really helped me to feel more comfortable in my own skin. Absolutely. I think you express that really well. There are a lot of misperceptions. There's not a lot of information out there in the public view, and it can lead to a lot of feelings of loneliness or feeling under, misunderstood and once that trait becomes kind of integrated into your everyday awareness and you start to bring in tools and, and make little adjustments to your everyday it's it's profound it can be really profound um, and it really does make a difference yeah absolutely because I think too with with that understanding and awareness you're able to let go of feelings of maybe just being very hard on yourself and Mm -hmm. lack of confidence or feeling like what's wrong with me, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something I see a lot with my clients is that sense of low self-esteem because as children, you know, we're especially misunderstood. We don't understand why we're feeling more shy or feeling more hesitant or we need more alone time. And a lot of times that gets um, stigmatized. So we have these labels put on us and we have to shed those and reclaim sensitivity as a, a positive. So April, what drew you to focus on this area? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. I love talking about this. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I think it was my first year, I discovered this trait and someone shared it with me. And then as I started to reflect, I realized, oh, I am highly sensitive. And everything just started to click into place. I really was able to understand myself at a deeper level, how I interact with the world, how I interact with relationships, how I experience work, even just how I interact with myself and my emotions and why I feel everything so deeply. And everything just started to make sense. And that was 
so healing for me, just knowing that part about myself. And I wanted to share that with others. So as I started working with clients and I was fortunate enough to be able to work with a few highly sensitive clients from the beginning and the work just really nourished me and I could see the impact it was having on the people. And so it feels like a mission for me to spread the message and to educate about high sensitivity and to let others know that this is real. This trait is something really important that is needed to know about. Um, you need to know about it and you need to be able to integrate it into your everyday awareness. And it's, yeah, it feels like a mission. It feels bigger than myself. Well, it's so important. You know, just I, mm -hmm. I have worked with um, several highly sensitive persons and mm -hmm. I can see just the challenge, you know, just in that parent child relationship where, mm -hmm. you know, the, the teenager or the child is a highly sensitive individual. The parent doesn't know this, doesn't understand this, is not highly sensitive. And it really, <laughs> it really creates so much, I just, so much, um, unnecessary difficulty and, you know, and mm -hmm. emotional suffering. And, and so that has really been powerful just seeing what can happen when neither of the individuals in a relationship realize that there is a highly sensitive individual here, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It's so true. It, it does have a huge impact on relationships, whether it be parent child or intimate partner or even adult child and parent or coworker. There's so many dynamics where it, it plays a part. And just highlighting the, the sensitivity piece can make a huge impact on just shedding awareness and bringing the two people closer together and, and understanding each other at a deeper level. So April, I want to shift gears right now because I, it's really important mm -hmm. to me that our listeners Mm -hmm. have clarity around the words we're using and what they mean. Yes. So can mm -hmm. you please, um, let's just start with who is the highly sensitive individual? Yes. Thank you for that, Lourdes. I think it's really important to define it. It really helps to um, deepen the understanding of what that is because there's a lot of misperceptions, as you said. So a highly sensitive person, also known as someone having the sensory processing sensitivity trait, so this is, this is an innate trait. So you're born with it. It's not a disorder. It's not um, a dysfunction. So you're born with this trait. It's found in 15 to 20% of the population and among all genders. So it, I think a lot of times we see it as mostly in women, but actually everyone has the equal chance of being highly sensitive. So it's just a temperament variation where our nervous systems and our brains are wired to notice really subtle details. So this used to be kind of an evolutionary tool for safety. And in the modern world, it can be more a source of stress and overwhelm. Um, so the you can define it by four characteristics. And it's a nice acronym, the DOES acronym, D-O-E-S. Now I'll go into that a little bit more. So the D is depth of processing. The O is overstimulation or overwhelm. The E is emotional responsiveness or empathy and the S being sensitive to subtle stimuli. So in all highly sensitive people, you'll see those four characteristics, despite gender, age, culture, those are very consistent. And I can go into those a little bit more if, if yeah, you think that, that is a that, good idea. Yeah, that would be great. Maybe um, just yeah. how that could actually show up, these these four letters. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, so if we translate that into everyday experience, the depth of processing processing just shows up as thinking really deeply, um, processing and reflecting before acting. So kind of being a little bit more um, intentional, slower to make decisions, taking more time with transitions. And that can also lead to deeper creativity, being more intuitive, being more perceptive. So there's actually a really uh, wonderful gift in that deep processing. Although a lot of times I think people focus on it as a negative, like, oh, I'm overthinking or, you know, I'm slow to react, but actually there's a I think there's a gift there. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, with this one, you know, this depth of processing, you know, one of the mm -hmm. things that I, I've experienced, and I, I've heard others say this is when someone wants a response from you, is asking you a question you, and it doesn't take mm -hmm. much to feel like you're on the spot, you know? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And allowing for that time, there's almost like a lapse. You ask a question and mm -hmm. there's like this silence and and to understand mm -hmm. that they're they're processing that they're taking it in, you yes, know? yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of room for that in our ever, in our present culture. Just to stop, just to reflect. You know, we're 
we're very much wired for instant gratification now. So it can be hard for the HSP to take that time. And what happens a lot of times is there's pressure to act or to respond. And then there can be regret later. Oh, I didn't get to think about that as much as I wanted to, or I might've made a different decision. So I encourage my clients, just take time, you know, let someone know, okay, thank you for that that inquiry. I'll think about it. I'll get back to you or just buy yourself a little bit of time or let me think about that for a moment. Just giving yourself permission to pause. I think can be really important. And then what about the O? The O. So this is the most challenging for HSPs. It's the overstimulation, the overwhelm. So with that deep thinking, that keen awareness of subtleties in our environments, it takes up a lot of energy processing. So we notice things that we're not even aware of. So we notice things on an unconscious level, nonverbal cues, subtle changes in the environment, sounds, lights, we're taking in everything. And that's exhausting. So it's easy to feel stressed. It's easy to feel anxious. Often this leads to trouble sleeping because our, our nervous systems are over aroused. Um, so th- this is the most difficult one. And a lot of my clients say, well, what's the positive here? And I was like, actually, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I really, it, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to find a flip, to, a flip side to the, to the O, to the overstimulation. So this is something where I think most of our energy comes in managing and being aware um, and in integrating self-care. And with, with the overstimulation or overwhelmment, is there mm-hmm. a correlation between this and the diagnosis of social anxiety? Ah, this is a really good question. So yes, so social okay. anxiety, actually, a lot of the times with HSPs can just be overstimulation. So um, with that depth of processing that comes back in here, where we go into a new environment, we pause, we reflect, we observe before acting. So in a new environment, we need time to take things in because our brains are cataloging everything that's new um, and all all of the the actions, the people, and making a lot of meaning behind it. So you're seeing two people interact, you're making a lot of meaning behind that, you're thinking, you're processing that deeply where someone else might just look and then move on. Um, So in social situations, there's a lot of stimulation coming in, there's a lot of information And that can lead to anxiety. So a lot of times HSPs think they have social anxiety, but it could be some of that. But a lot of times it's just the overstimulation. And I've I've had clients work through that and like, actually, I don't have social anxiety. I'm really good with people. I like spending, you know, meaningful time with people and I'm just overwhelmed or I'm overstimulated. That's a great distinction. Okay. And then what what about the E? Yes, the, the emotional responsiveness. So with with this piece, we feel everything deeply. So positive or negative emotions, we feel it very deeply. So this is good and bad. So on, on the good part is that we, we almost feel euphoric happiness when something goes well and something meaningful happens, when we have a deep connection with someone. It's beautiful. But then when something goes wrong, we, we overprocess, we feel really bad, we feel guilty. So there's we have wider extremes than a non-HSP would. Um, And that can also lead to difficulty regulating our emotions because they're so intense. So we can be more vulnerable to depression, to anxiety, um, to shyness, especially if our childhoods were um, problematic for us. So the emotional responsiveness piece to April, that would include feeling almost like you, you must respond. Like you almost, it's difficult to, Mm -hmm. to not respond for example, if mm-hmm. someone is sharing something, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have this desire to somehow um, engage. And even if you're not engaging, literally, mm-hmm. you are engaged. That's exactly right. Even if you're not verbally engaging, mentally, emotionally, you are engaged. You're, you're processing everything that's happening. Even if you're not able to verbalize it. And that's something that comes with it when we're feeling overstimulated. A lot of times we can't talk. We can't express and that can be really frustrating. So even if there is that desire to engage, to connect, a lot of times it's not possible for us, especially if there's a if there's a conflict or we're in a very noisy environment, maybe at a party or you know we're working in an open office plan. That overstimulation can actually hinder our ability to connect and respond, which has an emotional response. Oh my so it's goodness! All interconnected. <laughs> I can yes. totally relate to being so upset, mm-hmm. and I can't speak. Yeah. You know, you just exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. And then along with that conflict, which I think is really important, there's there's a fear of the conflict because again, 
it's, this all weaves together. It's, it's really amazing. You know, with the fear of conflict, we fear overstimulation. We fear that emotional impact of disappointing our partner or a friend or a loved one. And then what the, and we're also thinking about all the possible outcomes of what could happen if there is a conflict. So we tend to be conflict averse. We tend to have more um, emotions around conflict. Because again, the, the feelings, the emotions, we feel them so intensely. So conflict for an HSP is a very different experience for, than for someone mm-hmm. who is not. Absolutely. And even subtle forms of conflict can be difficult. Just saying, no, I don't want to go to a party. That can be a form of conflict for us. Something even very straightforward. Wow. So that really gives a really good understanding of um, what are some of the qualities or characteristics that mm-hmm. those who are highly sensitive have. And you've, spo- mm-hmm. you've spoken to this a little bit already, but I was wondering if you could share what are some of the, I guess, the common challenges or problems mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. highly sensitive persons experience? Absolutely. Um, so something I see a lot with my clients, one is just that feeling of being misunderstood, feeling lonely, feeling isolated, or feeling different, which often leads to low self-esteem. So even though we make up you know, almost 20% of the population, a lot of people don't know they're sensitive or they have repressed the sensitivity if, to survive or to, you know, to meet expectations of others. So even though we make up a good portion of the population, we don't know that we're sensitive. We don't know there's other people around us that are sensitive and we can feel different. We can also feel shameful to talk about it because it's seen as a weakness. Even the word sensitive um, can have a negative connotation, especially for men. I know mostly you're audience is women, but even for men, especially. So that's one big piece. And that's why I started doing highly sensitive person groups, because it's so important to be in community with each other, to move at a different pace, to move at a slower pace, to have deep, meaningful connections. That's another thing that can be really troublesome for an HSP if that is lacking in their life, meaningful connections and also meaningful work. So I see that a lot as well, work challenges. And I think too that that comes up with um, social interactions. What I one of the things mm-hmm. I hear is, you know, I I don't want to talk about you know superficial things, and I I can't find mm-hmm. people with whom I can have deep conversation, and so that becomes a, a challenge for for them. Absolutely right. Finding those people that you can be yourself with, that you can feel nourished by. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And there's, if it's okay to continue, I feel like there's a lot of things that HSPs struggle with. And we talked about the overstimulation and there's a whole host of things that are related to that. So if you are overstimulated, you're most likely exhausted, you have trouble concentrating, you're feeling anxious, maybe restless, and you're conflict avoidant at that, at that point. Um, so there's a lot of things that start to be impacted just by being overstimulated, just maybe by being underslept or having a lack of downtime. Just simple things like that have a huge impact on the HSP and can lead into struggles in many areas of life. And then oftentimes people get um, mislabeled as being anxious or depressed when they're actually just um, sleep deprived or overstimulated. There are other things, but I feel like the the overstimulation and the isolation are the two biggest. So one of the things I was I wanted to ask you about is, you know, what are some of the ways that an HSP who is not able to have the time to decompress, to who's not mm-hmm. able to honor who they are, how can this mm-hmm. show up as challenges in their in their lives in their day to day? So if they're not able to properly take care of themselves, what are the consequences of that? Yeah, or just any, and you spoke to some of them, Mm -hmm. you know, for example, you know, not Mm -hmm. having enough sleep or, you know, maybe what are some of the ways that this this shows up in the external world? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So a lot of times it shows up very commonly as anxiety and depression. Um, I see a lot of my clients come in and they're, they're feeling withdrawn, they're feeling depressed, they're feeling apathetic, mainly because they're just so exhausted, they're so dysregulated, their emotions are taking over. So the emo- when there's not enough time to process and rest, the emotions can start to take over. Because what happens is you're, there's so much going in, information, experiences, you know, social interactions, and there's not enough time to process all of that. And we need to process it all. We don't get to take 
a break from that. We need time to catch up with that processing. So that can be very troubling for an HSP. Um, so it accumulates. And that can cause trouble at work, in relationships, just in you know, your your own overall well-being. So it can be really, really trouble. The, the thing that I tell my clients the most is you have to sleep. If you can't do anything else, you have to sleep. <laughs> Giving time for that at night. Is there a connection between introversion and being highly sensitive? That's a good question. So actually 30% of HSPs are extroverts. So they're, they're separate personality traits. Um, so mostly, you know, there's a lot of overlap and you see most HSPs as introverts. But yeah, 30% are extroverts and need more social interaction and more a little bit more stimulation, but needing to be mindful of regulating and being careful not to be to get easily overwhelmed. That's interesting. You know, I, I, Mm -hmm. the assumption is that, you know, if you're highly sensitive, sensitive, you're probably Mm -hmm. introverted. So that's very interesting that you do have the extroverts also. Absolutely. And then it can be tricky to identify an extroverted HSP because there is that strong tendency to, um, towards introversion, towards, you know, um, taking more quiet time, um, not being as adventurous, things like that. Um, But the, the, extroverted HSP is going to want more engagement in the world, um, but will get tired easier than the non-HSP extroverts. So it's an interesting dynamic there. So what are, what are some of the ways that a person can begin to determine if they are in fact highly sensitive? Absolutely. So the, the best thing to do is th- take the self-test. So Elaine Aaron, who is the person that really introduced this topic to the public. She has a lot of books. She's done a lot of research. On her website, hsperson.com, there's a self-test. I also have a link to that on my website if people go to my website. That's the the gold standard. So you take the test. It looks at 27 different points, just reflecting on different traits and characteristics of an HSP. And that's the first step. And then also looking at the DELS model, you know, do those four points show up throughout your whole life? And if you're not sure about how it's showing up as an adult, it's really great to maybe sit with a parent or someone that knew as a child and answer the, the questions as you were a child. This is especially helpful for men or anyone that feels shameful about their, their trait. So that's, that's, the, that's the best place to start. Take the test, reflect on the four components of the traits, and then just do some self-exploration around it. There's no definitive test, but that's the, that's the best way to start. And... You know, when you work with with your clients, are what are the, mm-hmm. I guess what are the, what are your favorite ways of mm-hmm. helping an HSP to create a life that is more comfortable mm-hmm. and more authentic for them? Mm-hmm. This is a great question. So I love helping people create a life that is conducive to their traits. There's something that I've been thinking about recently, which is that we are a minority. You know, being sensitive, you are that is a minority class. And if you have other areas in your life where you are a minority, it can feel even more heavy. But recreating a norm, um, creating a lifestyle that works for you, that's conducive to your trades, that whatever that looks like, because you know all HSPs are a little bit different, even though we share um, some main characteristics. So looking at lifestyle, slowing down, getting more sleep. I like to incorporate a lot of mindfulness, just basic breathing practices. And self-compassion work because HSPs have oftentimes been taught that their trait is a weakness or it's not as valuable or there's been more focus on the struggles than the strengths. We can kind of, we can feel heavy about it. We can feel resistant to having a trait. Uh, We can feel like we're not as good enough. So I love to do self-compassion work. Just saying, you know, you're enough. You know, this is hard, but there's also a lot of gifts involved. And also um, increasing that self-awareness, knowing when you're getting dysregulated, knowing when you need downtime, knowing when you're feeling overwhelmed, just starting to create some awareness around that. That way you can take care of yourself. You can see how important this mindfulness piece is with this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Getting to know how you interact with the world and then creating a lifestyle that supports you. That way you can access your strengths because there's so many strengths to being sensitive. It is such a gift. It's just a matter of removing that storm of overwhelm, removing that layer 
of difficulty that comes with it. There's so many gifts to it. Yeah, because when you are in that overwhelm, it's almost Mm -hmm. incapacitating. Like you can't function. Absolutely. And I see that with clients. You know, they they quit their jobs. They pull out of their relationships. They disengage from the world because it's so much to handle. And it, it makes me sad because I see people that have such beautiful gifts and um, so much to offer, and yet they're retreating because life feels like too much. Right. And so it's, it's my, I want to share with people that you can stay engaged with the world. You can be a highly sensitive person in this world. It's just a matter of increasing that self-awareness, using tool, mindfulness tools to help regulate yourself, to keep your emotions manageable, um, and to keep that overwhelm and overstimulation at a reasonable level. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of managing it. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things for me that has been really helpful is I I realize that I need a lot of transition time Mm -hmm. and I cannot overschedule myself because (laughs) if if I do, I just, it's too much for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think that's such an important piece, normalizing that you, okay, I take longer to transition. That's just something I know about myself. And letting that be okay. And then preparing for it. Uh, For instance, with sleep, I always, I love to tell my clients, don't just think about how much sleep you need. Think about how much time you need to transition into sleep and then out of sleep in the the morning. And then letting that be your your sleep window. That's a great idea, April. (laughs) That's a great (laughs) idea because you're right. It takes longer to fall asleep because your mind is just going. And then it takes... You can't just pop out of bed either. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That actually can be really difficult for an HSP. I mean, a lot of people struggle with that too, but especially for HSPs, because we need time to think and prepare before acting. Our brains are inhibited for action. So we're, we're wired to look and observe and then act. Um, so we need time. We need time to slowly get out of bed, to think about our day, maybe to do a little mental planning before we take our first step out of the bed. And then same with going to bed. We need time to think about our day, to process it. And a lot of times that little bit of time before bed is the only time where we're not having any input. It's the only time we're completely quiet. So it makes sense why the brain wants to turn on. Right, right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage my clients, give yourself time to think, to let your mind wander. It's okay. It's okay that you're thinking deeply or that your mind wants to process for long periods of time there's a lot of gifts that come out of that it's just you know making time for it making space for that what has um surprised you most in your work with clients around high sensitivity Mm -hmm. i would say there's a there's two pieces one is just how heavy the trait can feel how difficult it can seem i i see people coming with a lot of resistance or concern or fear about it oh you mean I have this forever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it's a something bad. Am I gonna when when will this go away? <laughs> exactly. Right, exactly. Is this because they're they're worried, you know, because they've had a lot of difficulty or especially if they haven't known about the trait before. You know, can I manage this? You know, can I do the things that I want to do as a sensitive person? And I say, yes. I absolutely believe from my heart that you can, that it can be managed and you can thrive. It's just a matter of learning about yourself and creating a lifestyle that's really supportive. And the other part I would say is just how much my clients thrive because we as sensitive people, we are so impacted by positive interaction or even just deep reflection. So I just, I'm so amazed and I I get so emotional about it. I just, how much they thrive and seeing their successes and how much they take away from just reflecting on the trait, on you know things that are going well in their lives, around setting boundaries for themselves, around um, tapping into their gifts. There's so so much beauty in it. It's amazing. I am just overwhelmed with joy, especially in my group work, seeing people connect and just oh my god, it's so beautiful. And seeing them realize that oh, this trait is so. It's the flip side. This trait is actually ha- has a lot to offer me. Look how deeply I can connect, and look how um, intuitive I am look how caring and loving I am and looking look how creative I am and how much I get from the world yeah it's beautiful it's really beautiful 
It's almost as if um, for the highly sensitive person, he or she needs to create that space for themselves, mm. the space to mm. to move through life, the space to interact. All because again, it's I, and I when I refer to that space. I mean again, like that the way you move into transitions, the way you move out of transitions, yeah. how you take in information. But if mm-hmm. you can get to a place where that is all aligned with you, with yourself, mm-hmm. you're right. There is so much possibility. I, I'm thinking of mm-hmm. you know, several clients where once we got that figured out and they were able to structure things in their life in a way that was conducive and began to practice mindfulness and the boundaries are huge, mm-hmm. it was like they were a different person. <laughs> you know, there was this this uh, confidence mm-hmm. and this strength, and they're real. And, and for family and friends, really responding to them, like, "Wow, you've really changed." But really, it's mm-hmm. just they're not overwhelmed. They're not exhausted. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so true. When you take away all the weight of that, and it's, when it's amazing, and I love the word that uses alignment. When things are in alignment, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Use. <laughs> It's really incredible. And it, you're right. It is. It's like a different person, you know, because the, oh, this is really important. So a lot of times we think that the struggles of our sensitivity is the sensitivity or you know, that is us. Oh, I'm an anxious, being a highly sensitive person means I'm an anxious person. I'm an overwhelmed person. Um, I'm an overly emotional person. That's not true. <laughs> that is not true. Those are just kind of consequences of not knowing about the trait or not being able to take proper care of yourself. Those things, when those are gone, you thrive. You have so much to give. You're so full of life and and creativity, and it's amazing. Yeah. So it, I hope people can realize that the trait is not the struggle of the trait. It's it's separate. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It totally makes sense that the the anxiety, the struggle, is really showing what is keeping the highly sensitive person. From really thriving, it's a symptom. Mm-hmm, it's exactly. a sim- It's a symptom that they the are symptom. not that mm-hmm. they're out of alignment. Actually, mm-hmm. absolutely, exactly. Right, you're just out of alignment, and with some with mindfulness and awareness, that's where the gifts come out. Yeah. So, April, for those who have loved ones who are highly sensitive, so this would be spouses, partners, mm-hmm. parents, mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm significant others, what suggestions would you give to them um, for being able to to support this highly sensitive person in their life? Absolutely. This is a great question. It, it can be really challenging or um, confusing to talk to loved ones about it, you know, how to talk about it, what to say, and especially if it's something brand new for you, you may not feel as confident to talk about it or sometimes it can be hard to find the words. Um, so I would suggest doing a little bit of education around the trait, but doing it in small doses, checking with the interest level of the person. Have you heard about this trait? This is what it is. It's just a normal variation of the the nervous system. And it means that I think deeply and I feel things emotionally and there's actually a lot of gifts to it, but there's also some struggles and um, it can be helpful to put it into a context. So let's say with your partner, you could say, you know, I wanted to let you know that I've just discovered this trait and, you know, I'm, I'm highly sensitive and that means that I'm really caring and empathetic in our relationship. And I, you know, I notice those little details about you. And it also means that sometimes I get overwhelmed when we're having a conflict and, you know, those two go hand in hand. So highlighting that it's a package deal and then also making sure not to blame your sensitivity for anything because that can create the, the hi- it can highlight that it is a weakness when it's not. So in, if you don't want to go to a party or you don't want to go to a lot of events, not saying, oh, I can't go because I'm highly sensitive, just saying, you know, I'm tired and I don't want to go, setting those firm boundaries. So just to recap, gauging interest level with the person, I would say keeping it to small sound bites, just giving a little bit of information, seeing how the person responds and then giving more if they're interested highlighting that it is a package deal and how it shows up positively and maybe negatively in the relationship. And then also being mindful of how you're using your sensitivity. And this is something that I I probably should have asked at the beginning Mm -hmm. of the interview, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask it now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What would you say are some of the, and we touched on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are some of the misconceptions that people have 
about HSPs, and this could be HSPs themselves Mm -hmm. and those who are not HSPs? Oh, yes. This is a really good question. So how do our loved ones think about us or perceive us as as highly sensitive people? Yeah. What are some of their Mm -hmm. misperceptions? And and for those who are HSPs Mm -hmm. and maybe aren't aware of it, or they are Mm -hmm. even, Mm -hmm. what are misperceptions they can have about being highly sensitive? Absolutely. Um, we, you're right. We did talk about a few, but I'll just elaborate of, on some of the common misperceptions. One, that it only happens in women, right? So a lot of times people think, oh, that's that's a trait that only happens in women, where actually half are men that have the, the trait. Some people think that it's the same as introversion when, as we said before, up to 30% are extroverts. A lot of people think that it's, it can maybe it's a disorder, that it, oh, you just have depression or um, you have ADD or you're autistic. There's a lot of different um, disorders that get mixed up with high sensitivity when really it's actually just a, a temperament variation. It's a trait. And then mostly I think that it's a weakness or it's a limitation. This happens a lot with HSPs themselves where it feels like a limitation. It feels like a weakness. It feels like it's something wrong or unattractive. Um, and I think a lot of times our the people in our lives can view it that way too because they might get frustrated with us because we can't do certain things or because we're not as responsive or that we're overly emotional or yeah, things like that. Yeah. And I was thinking too, that some of the assumptions also might be, this is one that I I've Mm -hmm. heard parents express Mm -hmm. over their adult children that, that their child is fragile. Like they, that they're not Mm -hmm. able to Mm -hmm. take things because of their sensitivity, which I think is a really huge misperception. Mm -hmm. It's not that you can't talk to your child about difficult things. It's just how they get the information in that process. Absolutely. It's that that's true. It is seen as this fragility um, or this weakness. And you're right. Sensitive people can do anything that anyone else can do. It's just a matter of um, probably being regulated, being well slept. Um, (laughs) I think that's the most important thing. And just being mindful of how you're approaching a situation. You may need to do it a little differently. You may need to have a conversation a little bit differently, maybe taking breaks, stepping away, needing to pause. Yeah, Yeah. there's a lot of little things that you can do that that are conducive to your trait. And another thing that popped up as you were talking is this, I think there's a common misperception in addition to the introversion that we're shy or socially anxious, um, or a little bit neurotic, which all can be true, but they're not synonymous with the traits. A lot of times these labels get put on us because we are kind of holding back or we're, we're, we're taking time to reflect or we're kind of overly emotional or we feel things deeply. You know, so we get labeled with a lot of different things, especially as children. What I love, too, about what you've shared and highlighted, April, is that you know if you are highly sensitive – Mm-hmm. there's so much that you can do to actually mm-hmm. create a life that is comfortable for you and is authentic for you because a, mm-hmm. everything that you're sharing, these are s- things that the highly sensitive person can put into place. These are things that they can tell other people in their life. So mm-hmm. again, it's really empowering to have this knowledge about yourself because it helps you to now have more influence over what's coming at you from the world. Absolutely. You're right. It is. It's very empowering to know that with just a few small little adjustments that you can thrive and you can actually thrive more than a non-sensitive person, uh, which is pretty amazing um, because we feel things so deeply and we respond so, so much more to positive experiences. So when you are feeling good, you're feeling amazing. So you are feeling empowered, you're feeling inspired and you're feeling just really strong. Yeah. And it's usually these little simple things too, which I think people for, forget. Just, yeah, just getting enough sleep. Um, you know, taking a little bit of time for yourself, if possible. And I know that can be harder for people that are parents or caregivers or have more responsibility. But just a little bit of time. I love to practice with my clients just closing our eyes for sixty seconds and being quiet. Even just things like that throughout the day can make a huge difference. Yeah, I love that. That that little things really matter and can make a mm-hmm. huge difference for the highly mm-hmm. sensitive person again mm-hmm. and you don't need to rely on others to help with this i mean of course mm-hmm. you know they can help with their understanding and their right. um, mm-hmm. flexibility and patience with you but mm-hmm. really for the highly sensitive person there's so much you can do on your own and not even have to do a lot to begin to make meaningful change for yourself absolutely it's it's simple even with mindfulness practice it's just simple 
maybe even just sitting and breathing can be profound. So April, where can our listeners go if they want to learn more about your work and get in touch with you? And also, if you would like to share some of the resources that you have created Mm -hmm. for our listeners. Absolutely. So you can find me in two places. Uh, My practice site is expansiveheart.com. There's a lot of resources, tools. I have a blog geared towards highly sensitive people. And then if you sign up for my newsletter, you can get a self-care guide focused on the the highly sensitive person. And then also, if you're a highly sensitive therapist, you can find me at sensitivetherapist.com. Again, there's tools and resources, and I have a Facebook group as well, which you can find through there if you were looking for community. April, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today, for sharing your insights and your wisdom. This conversation is so important, and I'm really thankful that you were able to share of yourself today. Lourdes, thank you so much for opening up your platform for me to talk about high sensitivity. I think it's so important, and I'm, I'm so excited to be able to spread the message. So thank you. Thanks so much, April, and take care. Thank you. enjoyed today's conversation with April. She really deepened my understanding of high sensitivity, especially with her explanation of the qualities that those with high sensitivity have in common. The depth of processing, overwhelm or overstimulation, empathy, and sensory processing. I also found it fascinating about the connection between social anxiety and high sensitivity and that oftentimes what appears to be social anxiety is really a highly sensitive person who is overwhelmed and not able to move through life in a way that honors their high sensitivity. I also found it helpful that April shared how slowing things down can really make a difference for those with high sensitivity. Something as simple as closing your eyes for 60 seconds, for allowing for longer transition times, and for really taking good care of yourself, especially sleep. I loved the phrase that she used, which was, well slept. For show notes to today's episode and links to the resources mentioned, please visit www.lourdesviado.com forward slash women in depth. And you will be able to find links to April's website and learn more about high sensitivity, access the resources she has available, and receive her free guide, Simple Self-Care Tricks to Reduce Overwhelm. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.